So thank you to the organizers for the invitation. Uh, I was last here 11 years ago for what unofficially maybe was says 80th birthday conference. Maybe this time unofficially it's Jacques Tilouin's 60th birthday, maybe not. Anyway, but he's, he's turning 60, so I wish him a happy birthday. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk about sort of automorphic lifting. This topic is, talk is going to be a bit off topic. There's nothing very piadic about it. It's mainly sort of primes away from P. But so automorphic lifting in the sense of wilds and developments afterwards. Uh, so the kind of the work is mainly joint. One part of it is joint with Jack Thorne. And the other part is joint with Najimuddin Fakuddin and Ravi Ramakrishna. So in fact, uh, the inspiration for this uh, talk is the method of Ramakrishna, which he, he invented a method of lifting Galois representations maybe uh, 15 years ago in the early 2000s. And we, one wants to see what, the, what, what implications the lifting method of Ramakrishna has for automorphic lifting. Right, so I want to uh, talk about this. Some of this work is very old. I mean, some, some of these things I did maybe 15 years ago. But there's been, it's been revived recently in some recent work as well. So, uh, okay. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to assume not everyone is an expert in automorphic lifting. So I'm going to start with a very uh, sort of from, from the beginning. So let me go back to the work of Wiles in 94. Right, where he wanted to prove that uh, if you're given an elliptic curve of a Q, that arises from a kind of modular form. Or he wanted to go from an elliptic curve to a modular form. Right, so uh, so then this, this, the kind of step in his work was that he looked at the mod 3 representation arising from this elliptic curve and uh, looked at the action of the Galois group of Q, absolute Galois group of Q on it. And uh, you, and you have got a representation, uh, rho bar mod rho bar or something uh, from GQ to the to GL to F3, and this he could show because there's some accidental splitting. The, the this kind of map, uh, this uh, this representation lifts to character, characteristic characteristic zero, uh, even as a you know, this group GL to F3 lifts to characteristic zero because of that, and then using the fact that this group was solvable. He could use the langlands tunnel theorem to say that at least rho bar arose from a modular form. So then rho bar arises from some G. And maybe okay, after doing some work, maybe you can make it arise from some level n, which is perhaps uh, related to the conductor of E. Anyway, so you, you basically get some point to start uh, addressing the automorphy of Galois representations arising from E. So then he looked at the triadic representation arising from E, and then tried to lift this property from mod 3 to mod 3 squared to mod 27, etc. <clears throat> so for that, rather than doing this very naively, he kind of made it a more deformation theory argument by introducing some ring theory into the picture. So, so when one defines some, some kind of minimal deformation ring R, right? I won't define it. Some kind of minimal deformation ring R whose uh, points somehow one wants to match with the automorphic world. We want to match them with the points uh, of some Hecke algebra. So you have some minimal deformation ring R, and then you have some Hecke algebra T, right? Which acts upon some kind of uh, thing which uh, is related to modular forms. So, for example, you can make it act upon uh, H1 of some modular curve x not n, with, let's say ZP coefficients. And the fact that this mod 3 representation you're interested in is modular means that there is some maximal ideal of this Hecke algebra, which gives rise in some sense, right, via the Aikla-Shimura construction to uh, this rho bar, right? So therefore you can, you're going to be looking at some localized cohomology group, which has the virtue that it is kind of a cohomology group of a curve, so it's kind of essentially the only one, H0, H2 are negligible. Okay, and this T is uh, something which uh, people had studied a lot. Okay, just from general no, general fact, I mean, you do know that it's finite flat over ZP. Right, so that's kind of easy. And, uh, and the finer property was that one, one knew also it was Gorenstein. 
Yeah, so this was the situation which Wiles kind of entered in, in the sense he already, uh, this was already known, and this is due to me, so it's, it's a more delicate property. A finite planet, let's say, reduced also. Right, and so, typically, so, so what T typically could be, so an example of T would be something like it will maybe have two components, something it could be, a, it could be some, could be some ring like XY, so that X is in ZP squared, so that X is congruent to Y mod P or something. Right, so this would be the simplest example of some interesting T, which is not just ZP. So some various versions of ZP or finite extensions of ZP glued together, and uh, yeah, so and, and then R is something much more mysterious. One doesn't know a priori anything about it, besides the fact that it's some Noetherian object. And then for uh, there's a map from R to T, which basically arises from some universal property of this ring R. There's a Galois representation into GL to R, and there's a less formal representation into GL to T, right, coming from the work of Aiklo Shimura and patched together by Carriol. <clears throat> So then uh, this was a subject, you know, you can, that's also not hard, and so the, so the idea was to show that this was an isomorphism. So Wise kind of showed it this was an isomorphism. Right, so to go back to this elliptic curve, you have this triadic representation uh, coming from the elliptic curve. So the Tate module of E has an action of GQ, and that gives you a representation you're particularly interested in. Let's call it rho. Right? And uh, so that, that kind of, uh, by, by formal properties, that gives you a morphism from here to Z3. Then you want to somehow show it comes from T, right? Somehow that, that was the idea, and the, the way you should do it is by showing R equal to T. And on the other hand, this T does have a morphism, uh, which kind of makes this diagram, makes T non-empty. So there's this morphism coming from G, or I think I call it G, yeah. Right? Which may not be to Z3, but let me pretend it's to Z3. Yeah, and so the idea of Wiles was to kind of move this G to this morphism, right, deform. So the idea was a kind of a deformation theoretic argument, but there's not much much to deform here. These are like very still, there's a kind of not much moving here. So instead kind of you, so the idea of Wiles was to, inspired by ideas of Hida in fact, where uh, he tried to introduce power series uh, variables in this situation, right? As he says in the introduction of his paper, he was uh, trying to find a substitute for Hida theory in this setting, so some kind of, Horizontal heater uh, theory. Okay, so so the idea was okay. This R is called, T is very com complicated. It's kind of a complicated mixture of gluing together of various components. R one knows nothing about, and somehow you want to match the components of T with R, right? So the idea of Wiles was, maybe was to and, uh, and in the paper with Taylor and Wiles was to resolve this situation and go to a much simpler situation where everything is just smooth and. There's not much to do. It's obviously there's some isomorphism. Okay, so uh, so therefore the, I, the therefore the idea was to use deformation theory by introducing congruences. Okay, so uh, so in the end, kind of this is the famous kind of Taylor Wiles method. For, so this work I'm going to be, I'm going to describe just complements the Taylor Wiles method. I mean the main the high the highway to all these theorems is the Taylor Wiles method. But then you can kind of Play around with the edges and come up with some 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 small uh, variations. Okay, so uh, so then the Taylor Wiles method. That kind of some kind of you must have a theoretic idea is to kind of start with R and T and kind of deform it in some way to objects R infinity and T infinity. Right, and some of this, here you kind of resolve the problem. These are very complicated rings, and while these rings are very simple, right? And then the simple, what is how, how you can how do you prove, and there's a map from all these things which makes the diagram commute. These are infinity, t infinity are not real objects, but they arise from real objects via some kind of general nonsense. Okay, so r infinity. So uh, this is uh, you construct r infinity so that the tangent space of r has not grown, right? So somehow it's kind of very controlled. Kind of you. You say that it's, it's surjected onto by a certain power series ring and a certain number of variables. Right, so R, this R would be the dimension of some Galois cohomology group. It will be some dimension of some Selma group. I'm just going to put notation here. I'm not really defined to define this. This is, some, this is going to be the Selma group. 
So it's some finite dimensional group. So that's one thing you know about deformation. Is you can control the tangent spaces by general nonsense, right? By general obstruction theory. The only thing you know about basically R infinity or, or these R's is that you can, you have some, you can re, re -describe, you can describe the tangent space and maybe you can also present them in some way. But you don't know whether that presentation is, you can't prove anything about the presentation, but okay, there is some presentation. And the other thing is that in this picture, there, there was also a map from another ring of the same number of variables. Right, so so this uh, somehow uh, this 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 map came from the fact that you're kind of this uh, these rings uh, are infinity to infinity are glued together from rings where you're allowing ramification at sets of primes, and kind of the, the, these sets of primes introduce a local action into the picture, and these uh, this power series ring is some kind of version uh, patched version of this module. This is not subjective, sorry. Yeah. It may, it may be zeros of all, you know, so R infinity doesn't know anything about what this action is, but when you go to T infinity, right, some of that is it's interesting. So, uh, so uh, the other factor, which was kind of well-known, again, from, from coming, not well-known, but in the sense it was something, it's not surprising that the, when you have a covering of a modular curve, right, with some Galois group G, essentially the cohomology of Y, the first cohomology of Y becomes a free G module, right, up to, more or less. So because of that, I mean, so because of that kind of thing, you knew that T infinity, is a finite free is a free ZP ZP S1 SR module of finite rank. And furthermore, there was again a control theorem, just as in HEDA theory. There was, there was a control theorem that you got to R infinity to R and, and also here by modding out by the variables S1, right? Because these variables are abstract variables. Don't know anything about them. These variables are somehow more concrete, and they come from some some geometry, some very simple geometry of coverings of modular curves. And uh, so the other piece of data in this picture is that R infinity modulo the augmentation ideal of this guy. You recover the bottom ring by just looking at the co-invariance. So. And then, and then and now it's evident that okay, because by dimension counting, this this map is forced to be an isomorphism, and therefore you descend that isomorphism to this via the control theorem. Right? So somehow it was it was this picture of resolving. So what you've done is kind of you've made things which are very complicated into just power series rings, and there you can prove an isomorphism much more easily. Okay. <clears throat> so this method of course has proved very versatile and powerful, and keeps on generalizing to more and more contexts. <clears throat> And for probably tomorrow we'll hear much more difficult versions of, of this theorem. Okay, so uh, that's one thing I wanted to say. So this is a, okay, maybe just to, for those of you who have not really have studied this, in, where, 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 does, where, where does this patching come from? For example, what you do is, I mean, these are the so-called Taylor-Wiles primes. So these, uh, where does this R infinity come from? It comes from kind of other rings, R, Q, N. Right, where QN kind of is a ring where you, where, with a deformation ring which comes from allowing ramification at controlled sets of primes QN. Right, so this is kind of augmented rings by allowing ramification at QN. So what is QN? QN is a finite set of primes, finite set of R primes, where R is the same R as that tangent space to dimension. I mean, the fine set of R places, let's say QI. Right, and they're, they're these Taylor-Wiles primes, so they have the property that they're kind of adapted to rho bar. So rho bar of Frobenius of these primes uh, has distinct eigenvalues. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to put some subscript, but I won't. Okay, so where alpha is now equal to beta. Right, and uh, these, these things are highly congruent to one mod p to the n. Sorry, they're congruent to one mod p to the n. And what else? Yeah, and then they perform this job that the tangent space is kind of controlled, right? The tangent space has not grown. So just to put it in notation, that one just means that the dimension of the of this augmented deformation ring, which will be some H1L, let's say QN, augmented Selma group where you allow a kind of more or less arbitrary ramification at QN, is the same.
is, is the same as the original Selma, right? So the tangent space, that's, that's what gives you the upper bound, the Galois theoretic upper bound on the, on the, on the deformation thing. And then the, these variables, S1 up to SR, so that, that, can, that, that and these, this, these are, are infinite, of course, there are no maps between, uh, now, kind of, it was shocking in the beginning, but now kind of, everyone accepts there are no maps between, <laughs> between these RQNs for varying n, but just for compactness reasons, you can kind of glue them together. And uh, so that's the that's one thing, the Galois cohomology part, and the second, the automorphic for the congruences part. Is that somehow we insert so, so these RQNs map to the TQNs, right, which now act upon kind of okay, just to. I'm not going to be very accurate in various things I say. Okay, so let's look at x1 n or the x0. It doesn't matter. X2, x1 n q n. Where we have by q n, I mean the product of the primes in q n. So you augment the level. Right, and then this receives a diamond action. This because this is there's this covering x1. This kind of this covering x1 q to x0 q. Right, because of this, this receives a kind of di action of uh, z mod q n star. And this action is kind of free, and it's, it controls this more or less, but especially if you assume the first property, which rules out kind of these Steinberg, which rules out except everything except abelian type of congruences. Right? This, the, the job of the, of the first line is to say that nothing happens when you go from n to gamma naught n to gamma naught nq. There is no growth. After that, there's growth, and there's, pro, pro, there's lots of growth, and which is kind of formalized by saying that this is a free module over this. Right? Okay, so so that was and, and uh, so that was one. That was the first. Uh, so of course, this was historically the thing which came later. So this is one approach of Weiss, and there was also a second approach. I mean, I didn't call this one, so let me call this. Yeah, that was the second approach, which is this numerical isomorphism criterion. Okay, I forgot to say. Oh yeah, so from here, I mean, from this gives rise to this uh, Z, uh, ZP S1 SN action. This kind of maps to some PQN, and also uh, there is some version of this action for the for the for the deformation ring, which is much easier. But you can say nothing about that. But anyway, you get you get that from ZP to S. This action is certainly not injective. It's going to factor through because this is some finite situation. Anyway, so this is what these were the ingredients. I'm not telling you much more than the ingredients which went into which went into. Uh, I'm going to need some water. My mouth is running dry, so I'll go and get. I'm going to go and get water. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I go. I go. Okay. <laughs> Maybe it's the heat. I don't know. Wait, anyway. Okay. So, so this was this was this was one uh, this was one uh, approach of Weiss. But historically, the earlier approach was via the numerical isomorphism criteria. And perhaps what I'm going to talk about is more closely related to this. Weil's earlier had a less exotic kind of approach to this, which was kind of more in the tradition of L function. Again, I took inspiration from a work of Hida. So, so there you had this R and T. And uh, now this has an augmentation which I'm going to call pi, maybe. Okay. Which, which was maybe coming from this G or something uh, to ZP, or it could be to O, some finite extension of ZP. And you wanted, uh, so you knew this was finite flat Gorenstein. And you wanted to conclude somehow that this map is an isomorphism in terms of this augmentation, right? But you have to kind of, while identify two, two invariants which are, which were suggested by the formula of Hida about, uh, about the L function uh, associated with the adjoint of this, uh, some adjoint L function associated to G. So he had kind of made some. Okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> thank, thank, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah, I drank two, three glasses of water before. But... Thanks. Okay. So yeah. So so you so so the so the other approach of Wiles, which uh, which kind of which we was trying to uh, carry out using Euler systems, was uh, was an approach which kind of looked at this augmentation, looked this looked at this map to ZP or O given by the modular form he had in the he had at hand, 
and relate to numerical invariants associated to this. So that came from, in some sense, there was a formula of HEDA which told you that if you looked at some kind of adjoint L function and divide by, divide by some kind of automorphic period, integrally well defined up to some ZP units or something, uh, then this is related to some congruence number. This is, this is related, related to a congruence number which measured congruences between G and other forms which were not G in the, of the same level or something. Right, and on the other hand, block auto had, uh, the formalism of block, block auto says that this should be the same as, uh, that this, this, this number should be the same as some Selma group. Right, so, there, so therefore, I mean, uh, uh, Wiles approach was to try and prove block auto conjecture by proving that this congruence number is the same as some Selma group, and that Selma group is, is, the, is, is, the, okay, is the tangent space of this R, this morphism R. Right, so okay, so uh, just to make it less vague, let me say at least that uh, <coughs> so by block out of this should also be the Selma group and the Selma group in question was some kind of uh, mod Q, a divisible version of the Selma group I wrote, so the corresponding Selma group is some H1F or something of uh, Q uh, of the same add rho G, uh, that's a different, okay, add rho G or something, tensor QP mod ZP, looked at it integrally and then, I'm afraid I'm kind of omitting lots of technical details, the bar should be reducible, all that, that's coming out, it's just, I'm just, <laughs> just wanting to convey the spirit of the method. Anyway, so this is the, so this, uh, by block Carter would assert that this, this number is supposed to be equal to this, the, the Selma group. On the other hand, formally, this is identified with, uh, what should I call this, uh, pi prime maybe. So uh, this is formally identified with the tangent space of the, of the, of the map from R to O, given by this modular form G. And so just formally this is equal to kernel of pi prime, modulo of kernel of pi prime squared. Yeah, so therefore why the idea was to uh, prove, I mean maybe it was to, <laughs> okay, uh, was to prove block Cato and, uh, and somehow the, the reason we might, we might have been interested in proving the block Cato because he had kind of identified a very subtle or, or a piece of commutative algebra which then would prove everything, right? So, uh, so the here's why is numerical isomorphism criterion. And maybe this is uh, also there in work of Tate and so on, so Wiles kind of, uh, kind of put together the various things which were uh, around, but he saw the relevance of that, all that in this setting. He came up with this criterion, which was perhaps, again. Okay, so, so the criterion was that suppose, uh, so we have this situation that T is finite flat and you have this morphism, uh, pi, and it's reduced, and uh, uh, suppose you could show, assume, this tangent space is finite, so let me call this something, let me call this phi, Without the cardinality, okay, uh, let me call this phi pi prime, right? So the, so the tangent space is phi pi prime and the ta cardinality is the cardinality. Okay, so then assume uh, that uh, this thing is uh, less than infinity and that there's this, uh, there's, there's this uh, equality of, con of the congruence number. Basically, one asserts that if there's equality between the Selma group between the Selma group and the order of the Selma group and the congruence number, right? Well, what is the congruence number? So assume, and you, you look at this now, look at this object. O modulo uh, pi of annihilator of kernel of pi. Right, annihilator in T. Okay, my pi is in T, they're looking the same, but let me. Right, so, so this is the kind of congruence module, and suppose, uh, and assume, and assume, that the cardinality of this guy, of this congruence module, which is somehow the, this number, the, this, this order roughly shows up in, in Hida's formula for the joint L function. And suppose you could show that that was the same as the tangent space. Uh, okay, the fact that it's less than infinity is contained, maybe I'm just in this, uh, phi pi prime. 
Let's yes, suppose so there's a by, by some uh, fitting ideal argument, one knows that the order of this dominates the order of this. So one, one needs the reverse inequality. And uh, so suppose you had this, then the map from R to T is an isomorphism. Right, so this was the second approach of Wise, where you kind of, uh, which is more, more, makes it's more conventional. I mean, kind of, at least it's kind of less bizarre at first sight, where you kind of try to prove R equal to T just by uh, without doing all this, uh, putting it into a tower and so on. Okay. So, but on the, on the other hand, I mean, this approach didn't, didn't initially work uh, because of some problems. Okay. So now, uh, but on the other hand, so Wise's argument uh, in his paper, in his original paper was divided into two parts. One was the minimal case he handled via the taylor wise system, and the non-minimal case. Once you go, the non-minimal case he handled via the numerical isomorphism criteria, right? So there were, there were two stages in which the work happened. But now, okay, so, uh, so that's what I, so this was my introduction of to the Wiles method. And now I want to say that what one can do to, uh, how this can, how this is related to some work of Ramakrishna. Are there any questions? So these two uh, things together proved the proved the modularity of the elliptic curve he he was looking at. So okay, so now uh, now now let me look at the work of Ramakrishna, which is which is a work purely on the Galois cohomology side. It doesn't really have much to do with modular forms, and it kind of replaces this 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 board here, right? Instead of Taylor wise primes, Ramakrishna, after thinking about it for several years, I think, found uh, he was interested in this question, which again I think had been around since Sayer formulated his conjecture whether a mod p representation of Right, he was basically interested in the question whether a GL2K representation, which is irreducible and odd, lifts to characteristic zero in a geometric way. Right, but, but in doing that, he introduced a method which, in fact, uh, has some other kind of com things come out in the wash, which are also interesting. Right, so so he so he what he did was. He looked at it as a different set of primes Q. He looked at a set of primes Q, which were kind of the opposite of Taylor Wiles primes in some sense. So he looked at primes Q, which were, uh, so again, he will start with a Selmer group, and he wants to kill the Selmer group. Wiles merely wants to kill the dual Selmer. For Ramakrishna, he has to kill Selmer and dual Selmer. Okay, so, so you start with this Selmer group. And uh, so, so as I said, I mean, this ring R, uh, this ring T itself is complicated. R may, R may be even more complicated, especially if you don't know what its relation to R is. Anyway, so uh, you want to understand this ring R, you know that it has this tangent space, which is roughly given by this, the number of variables. And then there's also the dual Selma, which gives you the relations. Yeah, twisted, twisted by the mod P simplicity character. So this is the Selma and dual Selma. And, uh, and because of the because of the situation, there was a there was an equal, there was a numerical coincidence that the Selmer and dual Selmer were equal in size, which was important in Wiles' work. Right, the Selmer and dual Selmer were of the same dimension because of the by the for to take and the, because of the specifics of the situations. And now what what what, why, what uh, Ramakrishna did was uh, he got a way of not only of. Uh, you got a way of adding primes and ramification conditions so that the Selma group and the dual Selma group both became zero, right? So the, the Ramakrishna method was to find sets of primes Q, which are reasonable in the sense kind of, perhaps you can make this zero in some trivial way, but okay, but uh, so what Ramakrishna did was he, he found sets of primes Q. So these are the Ramakrishna primes. So these were primes Q, which were not, which were basically, essentially, okay, they can sometimes be congruent to one mod P, but it doesn't matter, but so Q, let me say Q not, typically not congruent to one mod P, uh, at which rho bar is unramified, and rho bar of rob Q, in fact, is of the form alpha beta, alpha Q beta Q, because actually there could be a star here, but anyway, so alpha beta and such that alpha upon beta in some ordering is equal to Q. Right, so so this is these are the level raising primes of ribbit, and okay. So what are the conditions? Yeah. So he could he could and and then then instead of looking at uh, so in, in in Taylor wise you went from R to R Q N, and R Q at Q N you were very lax, right? You allowed all kinds of ramifications. But Ramakrishna, what he did was he rigidified the lift by not only imposing conditions 
on inertia, but he in imposed conditions on Frobenius, on the entire Galois group. Right? So what, what Ramakrishna did was that he did Ramakrishna's deformation condition. Was that he looked at lifts which were kind of Steinberg, right? He looked at the definite local. He looked at local lifts of this. Okay, uh, but so he looked at li local lifts. So these are representations of the Galois group. I mean, they, they are only representations of GQ. But let me Lo local representations from GQ from the Galois group of this of the two GL two whatever. Such that such that uh, kind of they they, they mapped and uh, they, they were of the form. They were the form uh, essentially, okay. Where the chi is a, essentially, okay, I've got some twist. Uh, where where chi is the cyclot periodic cyclotomic character. Up to some twist. Right, in terms of the automorphic behavior, now one is allowing ramification at a prime Q where there are lots of non-abelian congruences. There are going to be congruences which happen going from X not N to X not NQ, right? And so, and, and in fact, if you assume Q not congruent to 1 mod P, there are no congruences further, right? So these are kind of the opposite in some way, very different from Taylor-wise prime. And Ramakrishna's beautiful discovery was that you could uh, look at such primes. He identified this to be a good deformation condition to look at. It's like a smooth condition. And, uh, but on the other hand, killing Selmer and, dual, and the dual Selmer becomes much more delicate here because kind of somehow the local condition is more restricted. So, but anyway, so he, had, he found this beautiful method to kill dual Selmer and dual Selmer using these primes. Right, so what he did was, it says, so then Ramakrishna, the theorem of Ramakrishna. Is that there exists a finite set of primes Q of there exists a finite set Q of primes of R primes, these Ramakrishna primes, such that this kind of so, the, so this is some local, local deformation ring. Now you can look at the global deformation ring where you allow ramification at such primes and where you impose this local condition. Right? So I'm going to call this ring Q nu, such that kind of this Ramakrishna deformation ring, such that this Ramakrishna deformation ring, which maybe will start with some already existing set of primes in the ramification, allow ramification at ex extra primes, and then impose this very rigid condition, where you, in, in fact, even tape down, pin down what Frobenius does. Right, so that I call the Q nu, what he one can call the Q nu condition, right, is isomorphic to, let's say, ZP or the Witt vector or something. It's a kind of a smooth ring, smooth ring. Right, so he gets a lift, but he gets a unique lift with certain local properties. Right, so somehow he was not aiming for this, perhaps he was not aiming to get a unique lift with given local properties, but that's what came out of his method. Right, he got a lift, which, he was, which is what he was after, but he also got a lift with uh, unique properties, uh, which is characterized by local properties at these primes Q and S. Okay, so but now here one has some automatic R equal to T theorems, right? So that's some of, some of this new approach to, uh, not new, in the, sense, the approach to uh, R equal to T via Ramakrishna primes is to next observe which was kind of, would be some, something which immediately <laughs> experts would uh, see, is that R, RS union, here you have an automatic R, R equal to T. Right? That again comes from the fact that uh, the theory of congruences between modular form, this is isomorphic to the corresponding T, whatever that is, right? right? Because, I mean, the, this is because the, there is a, the, there will be some automorphic, there, there will be some uh, hackering which acts upon some certain su suitable space of H1 coming from some Shimura curves, coming from a quaternion algebra ramified at the primes in Q, some indefinite qu quaternion algebra. It was uh, uh, arranged something about the parity Q, which I'm going to not talk about. And uh, so the, the, this will be kind of acting on some Shimura curve. And it'll be a theorem, it's a theorem of uh, as developments of Ribbit's method of level raising uh, due to Diamond and Taylor uh, would, would tell you that the, the maximal ideal M propagates from level N to level NQ. And you can just, just look, look at the Shimura curve, indefinite uh, Shimura curve coming from quaternion algebra ramified at the primes in Q. And so that you'll have some kind of Hecke algebra acting upon this. And this thing is non-empty. This, this is non-zero. And the fact that this is ZP leaves no choice but to 
So initially, you just have a surjective map here, but this is just isomorphic to ZP, or anyway, it doesn't have any tangent space. So therefore, you deduce that this is an isomorphism. Right, so this is kind of for free. You, 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 get, you get an R equal to T theorem, not for free, but from, from this Galois cohomology method, plus level raising. Right, you get an automatic R equal to T. Okay, so then, uh, so th then this opens up the question of whether one can then use this to, uh, so this is something I tried to do 10, 15 years ago, uh, to try and use this to give, give, give approaches to why this theorems. Right, and you, in fact you can. Of course these methods become more demanding because why is, this, why is this theorem by now have become, at least in the classical setting, they use hardly any arithmetic geometry besides the work of Eichler, Shimura, Delina, attaching Galois representations to modular form. Well, here you need some kind of, you, you need more, more kind of arithmetic geometry arguments. But here, so how do you, how do you go from here to R equal to T? So you have some restricted R equal to T. So now the question is you have to be able to free, free the restrictions, right, or, or these Q new restrictions. So you have to free these conditions. So that, for that, for that the numerical isomorphism criterion comes useful. So in some sense, this goes back to Revile's original uh, method of trying to prove R equal to T, to do it via the numerical isomorphism right now. Okay, so I have it here. So, I'm, so basically what you, you want to, there, now there, were, there, there are a couple, couple of approaches kind of I thought about of going from here to automorphic lifting theorems. Right, one is an approach through the numerical isomorphism criterion. Which I'll just talk about right now. And the other approach is a slightly different approach which is much more naive. It's, this is numerical isomorphism at least I find quite sophisticated in the sense it's kind of some subtle thing why it's developed. Right, well, you can do something much more naive. You can just, uh, if, you're, if you're interested in the automorphism of some random rep of some in rep representation you're interested in. You can try and write it as a limit of these representations, which are automatically modular, right? So you kind of try to write this as a limit, as a periodic limit. So this is the second approach. As a periodic limit of uh, representations arising, which, which are these rigidified representations, which are automatically modular, once you know level raising. So you write it as a limit, and uh, then you have to do and some of that kind of proves it's pro-automorphic in some ways of some arbitrary level, but then you have to do some level lowering. Right, so uh, both approaches are kind of, uh, yeah, they require some arithmetic geometry, you need some ways of lowering, lowering levels. Okay, let me, first, let me just focus on the numerical isomorphism criterion method. So what you do here is, so that kind of related to what I, end, what I want to end this talk with. All right, so you, so, you, so you have this or you have this kind of relatively direct R equal to T theorem and you want to kind of make it a more general one. Right, so, so somehow in the, in, the, in the picture is the Shimura variety or the Shimura curve which is, which, which is mapping, let's say, let's say for simplicity to the elliptic curve you're interested in proving is modular or something, or, or rather to the, to the, to this G, right, this G gives rise to some kind of, maybe let's assume it's an elliptic curve, let's pretend it's an elliptic curve. So you have a map from Shimura curve of uh, ramified Q to E, right, and now, now you want to lift this, uh, you want to relax these conditions gradually. Right, so this Q, for example, might be consist of some even, uh, even, uh, even number of primes, let's say. You can arrange that if you want. Right, all these, these are these Ramakrishna primes, not congruent to one mod P, and the Frobenius is a regular element. Right, so you could also assume Q is congruent to one mod P, then just demand that this is regular unipotent. That also works, and that's useful. And uh, yeah, okay. So these, so these are these primes Q. And now you kind of, you, uh, so this, this has some parameterization phi Q. Right, and this has some degree, so there's some kind of optimal parameterization. And uh, this has some degree, and basically what, to, uh, to, what you have to do is, to apply the wise numerical isomorphism criterion, the, the, the eta invariant, or this congruence module invariant is roughly, uh, basically the degree of this morphism, right, or it's related to that. And now what you do is you kind of drop, you, you make the quaternion algebra less ramified, let's say at uh, even uh, two primes. So you drop, let's say, the first two primes. And this will also have some kind of something up to isosceles. So it'll have some uh, parameterization. Let's say call it, let's call it uh, let me call this Q prime, phi Q prime, 
right? So I'm going from a very, very restrictive R equal to T theorem with Q new condition at all primes in Q to a less restrictive. I'm trying to, trying to go from a very restrictive to a slightly less restrictive R equal to T theorem. Right, now you have a map, you want to prove this to be an isomorphism. You, are, you, you, you still have this kind of, this, this, no, this is not the G, but this is some, this is some, some morphism. This is just this isomorphism to, to ZP, right? Which corresponds to some geometric object I'm calling it E. It could be something. And, uh, and I want to see what, what happens. So of course, the, you, 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 this induces a map of this larger ring. You have to see how, the, how these invariants of Wiles grow as you relax the condition of newness. Right? So the idea is to kind of, you relax these conditions of newness at two primes, for example, and see how the tangent space has grown from here to here, and how the congruence module has gone from, grown from here to here. Right? So somehow that's what you have to do. One, uh, so, the con so both are controlled by some monodromy, kind of, uh, both are controlled by the divisibility of this guy, of the upper shoulder by P to by, by power of P. Okay, so what controls the growth of the tangent space and the growth of the congruence module is the depth of the ramification at these primes you're dropping. Right, so on the Galois side, that's very easy. On the Galois cohomology side, to uh, upper bound, to give an upper bound on the growth of the tangent space is easy. While the bound, well, to give a lower bound on the growth of the degree is, is kind of more subtle, and his work of Ribbit and Takahashi. So from this, I know, okay, look, so, so to cut a long story short, let me just say that the tangent space of this, what do I call it? Uh, so this, uh, the tangent space, okay, let me just say the tangent space growth as you relax the condition of newness, it's basically bounded above by, uh, by the car, by, by basically by uh, modulo kind of the divisibility. So this, so this representation rho q nu, if you look at this representation which Ramakrishna constructs, when you evaluate it at some kind of generator of the ZP quotient of the inertia, let's say at Q1, QI, that is going to be something of the form, so this is a generator of some tame inertia, the ZP quotient. This will go to something of the form 1 P to the Ni 0, 1, right? And then the depth of this ramification, the depth of this uh, kind of ramification is what controls the tangent space by a simple computation in galois cohomology So this is upper bounded by, so the growth is upper bounded by P to the, let's say, N1 plus N2. Right, P to the N1 time. Uh, okay, I don't need, I could have just said, okay, uh, yeah, uh, and, uh, or maybe there should be a uniformizer there, okay, and then, the, and then the congruence module, the growth of the degree, growth of the modular, growth of degree of modular parameterization. is lower bounded by the same quantity. Right, and then therefore, I mean, the, the, from, from this you get, an, uh, you get that once, because you start with a situation where Weil's criteria is, 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 is obviously satisfied, everything is ZP, and when you go to a more complicated situation, you control, uh, you can, the, the, the tangent space and the congruence module grow d in complete sync, right? So the Weil's numerical isomorphism criteria is again verified. <laughs> For this augmented situation, of course, with, uh, for this augmented situation with the same augmentation, right? You're considering the same map, the same Q new modular form. So that so that so that gave a different that gave a that gave a, a different approach to why these theorems, which doesn't use state patching. On the other hand, Thorn, okay, so Jack Thorn realized, okay, not this argument, but the second argument, which I'm not talking about. Uh, he realized that if you combine the two methods, in fact, you get something better. But this method by itself is kind of somewhat restrictive; it doesn't really prove the ideal R equality. It doesn't prove the automorphism of the things you would want, maybe, uh, by itself. But if you combine that, this plus Taylor-wise, you can cover the blind spots of some blind spots of Taylor-wise method and prove uh, more. So for example, as a uh, Thorn in maybe a couple of, uh, four or five years ago, used a combination of this kind of Ramakrishna's method and these methods of level lowering, plus or taylor uh, to prove uh, that, for example, all if you look at ZP, if you look at P, and you look at Q infinity, the ZP, ZP, ZP extension of uh, Q. Q. Right, somehow this was some, I mean, of course, the main method is the Taylor-wise, but to kind of to get it really to work and to prove, 
theorems without extra hypothesis. Uh, it's useful to have this method also in your armory. So then he proved that then uh, any elliptic of E over Q, Q infinity is modular. Of course, it'll be defined over some finite axis, so any is, is modular. So it'll come from a Hilbert model. The L series will be the same as the L series coming from a Hilbert model form of 8222. Uh, no, no, this, I mean, I'm just stating it in this way. Maybe that's how he states it. It's this, you're given an elliptic curve defined over some extension f sitting inside q infinity. And one is saying that it comes from a Hilbert model from, from that field. Okay, so, so this is kind of, so on the other hand, it'll be more, inter I mean, I would like, so I want to end by, because I kind of, my historical introduction went on too long, but uh, I want to end by, try, by try, try, trying to say how you could, uh, why maybe, I, why one, I mean, uh, this, it covers this kind of uh, methods and also the, there are some extra cases uh, in, in joint work with Thorn that we did about S5 representations, but uh, okay, so my main interest now is to come to the second part of the, this joint, the second joint work which I was talking about, which is uh, how do you now go beyond uh, this classical situation? Okay, so now in, uh, to simulate what some, some general situation, I'm going to assume f is a CM field, right? And there will there will be some R and T here. Okay, I'm not going to. There will be some deformation ring R you want to prove to T. Right, so the insight of uh, Frank Allegory and uh, Garrity was to adapt uh, adapt the Taylorwise method to this situation, right? To where some of the problem was that okay, you have an R. This is much more problematic. This is much uh, because this T is not very well behaved. But you want to prove it to be uh, you want to again prove in some kind of R equal to T isomorphism. So again, the idea would be perhaps to allow ramification at these Taylor-wise type of primes. Okay, and I'm, again, I'm considering only GL2, GL2 representations. Right, and rested, you'll assume it's automorphic and some suitable. I'm to, uh, it's automorphic and suitable. So I want to address the auto automorphy of rho coming from, it, it should in some suitable sense come from a modular form on, coming from, some modular form on F. Okay, so the, now the idea was the, that what, what Calgary and Garrity did was that you, you kind of look at this, uh, they, for, they found some situation like this where now there's a new num numerical uh, uh, iso coincidence where, in, where you have some, something related, something similar, but except that the tangent space has become smaller in comparison to the diamond action. Right, so there's this defect delta. With this delta in the case of F will be half the degree of F over Q. So delta is equal to R2. Right, where f is where the, where the degree of f is two times r two. And so you have a you 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 have a Galois theoretic control of this upper bound on this ring. And on the other hand, using automorphic forms or the cohomology, Betty cohomology of these of the arithmetic groups of GL two of OF, you will get a kind of map, not subjective again. You will get a map from a ZP of a of a larger number of variables. Right? And now you have to confront it with a situation where the corresponding kind of cohomology groups, they're, they, they're no longer concentrated in one degree. That will gamma will be some congruent subgroup of G, GL2 of OF or something. And uh, the, this will be, there will be some kind of diamond action coming in, but now the action is no longer free. Right? So instead, instead of knowing that this is free over this, you control the co-dimension of this as a, of T infinity as a ZPS1 SR, SR module. So then the calgary Garrity method is to, is to kind of, is this insight that uh, because of this, the fact that the cohomologies of this are more, more or less expected to be concentrated in a certain range, which is exactly R2, the defect. So that's the numerical coincidence that this, this delta, which is the range of cohomology, range of degrees of cohomology, shows up in this uh, diagram. Right? So that's the new numer numerical coincidence as discovered by them. Uh, they show that the co-dimension of T infinity as a S, as a ZPS1 SR module is it is is uh, is it at least or at most uh, is uh, at most I suppose right is at most delta and then again then again you conclude that R infinity equal to T infinity and then you go down right so there was this new there was this method so the first method of the Wiles has been has been generalized now to this situation now what about the second method right how, how do you generalize the how do you uh, 
And of course, there's been a lot of developments of this because this is in this original form, it was restricted because you needed all kinds of assumptions. But if you're just interested in automorphy, there's this 10 author paper which uh, addresses, uh, which proves these things now without any conjectures about concentration of cohomology, this integral cohomology in a certain range. Okay, but, uh, but uh, let me turn now to the last part, which is somewhat speculative. Okay, now what can, what can you do about the second method of Wiles? Okay, so maybe just to give this a caption, let me call this quantitative level lowering and... Okay, maybe I should finish, everyone's probably hungry. Okay, so quantitative level lowering and, and the numerical isomorphism criterion of Wiles. Right, so, so one wants to kind of uh, do Ramakrishna kind of methods in this situation, but now here you, there's a problem that if you look at kind of these deformation rings for F, which is not totally real, for example, CM, uh, this ring is kind of obstructed, right? So somehow the presentation will give you, will, will give you kind of more relations than generators, kind of the, the way it will be presented if you use the, the abstract formalism. Will be, there'll be some kind of, right, so the same delta shows up in various guises and for the more or less, the same reasons on the Galois side and for another reason on the automorphic side. And, and, and this is captured by the fact that the Selmer and dual Selmer are no longer in balance. The, the Selmer is, the dimension of the Selmer group is delta less dimensional than, than the dual Selmer. So Ramakrishna's method do, do not work, right? And they expected not, one should not be able to produce lifts in a very systematic way, perhaps in this setting. So what one can do is, so this is kind of some minimal deformation ring. Okay, and uh, so okay, so now so what one does is so one basically, but of course, one, what, what 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 one expects is that if you, for example, go to a much bigger ring, so like some ordinary deformation ring, where you kind of re relax the condition of say finite flatness at p or something primes above p to just being ordinary, then this ring is is nice, right? It's a, it's an un un it's at least conjecturally it's supposed to be an unobstructed ring. It's supposed to be smooth, uh, or you know, at least a fine, it's a complete intersection of the right dimension. So here Ramakrishna's methods work, right? So in fact, just to make the thing work very similar to Ramakrishna, I'm gonna look at half ordinary, in the sense where I kind of fix half of the Hodge state weights. That, that, just, that, just, that just results in the fact that you get a presentation with the same number of generators and relations. So here one expects maybe the, the conjecture would be that this ring is finite flat complete intersection of water. Right, so now you rise to a level where kind of you kind of try to, I mean, rise to a level where uh, one expects things to be nice, right? And now you can implement Ramakrishna's method here, right? So here, so here, so this, uh, not a very elegant name, but okay, let me just carry it. So here Ramakrishna's method works. So, so then the theorem of it uh, with Fakruddin and, and Ramakrishna is that uh, there exists a set of primes Q for which the Ramakrishna style things happen. So there exists a set of primes Q Right, such that uh, you can define a Q new quotient of this ring by allowing ramification at Q. So if you look at this kind of, I mean, I could work with the ordinary ring, but okay, just for. So now I allow Q new. Ella. Right, this ring becomes isomorphic to ZP, and the corresponding Galois representation, now you cannot kind of try to rely on monodromy arguments. I mean, there's no geometry in some sense in the picture, at least not obviously. Because in work of Scholzer, I mean, these kind of, yeah. There is some geometry maybe that's somewhere. Okay, so, so, and so you get this ring and such that the corresponding representation, which I'm just gonna call rho Q nu, is ramified at all the primes in Q. Right, it could be that these violate monodromy purity and kind of the, it's, these are semi-simple representations on inertia on, with eigenvalues Q and one, right? So you have to get, get around that. Is the ramified at all primes in Q. So that already in very old work of Ramakrishna and myself, we, would, we had done this. But I mean, in some sort of setting which directly generalizes here. Right? In fact, you can, you can even say that it's ramified with exactly depth P, in the sense so that, for example, it's ramified, and for example, you could say if you want that rho Q nu 
of tau q for tau q generator of the ZP quotient of inertia is just 1p01 or something. Yeah, so it's kind of the minimum, the max, best possible ramification. It's as shallow as possible or as deep as possible. Uh, okay, so, 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 so you have the situation and now what, what, what is it? Okay, so I want to end with the problematic or whatever the, tent, the hope or not hope, but the situation. Okay, can one prove, now the conjecture, these are kind of Leopold type conjectures you want, or Mesa conjectures for dimensions of deformation rings. You want to compute the dimension of this ring, right? You want to compute the dimension of this ring R odd and there'll be some expected answer from obstruction theory. And that obstruction theory answer will be implied and will, will be implied by showing that this ring is finite, is, is a ring of dimension one. So, so, so here is a piece of, here we kind of observed a very trivial, small modification, uh, generalization of uh, Wiles' criterion. So what happens here is that you have this, let me, let me just call this R. Okay, so, so this ring R, okay, let me call it R Q nu. Okay, let me end, okay, so R Q nu. So you have this morphism of R Q nu, when it's just isomorphic to ZP, such that the corresponding two-dimensional representation is very ramified at all the primes in Q. On the other end, so, the, so the, you have this ring R Q, where you impose, where you allow ramification at Q, but you are not imposing this condition of Q nu, right? So that's kind of a, so this is the ring you want to be, want to be able to control because the actual ring you want to control is maybe, just the ring with no cues in it, right? So some of this is a situation of kind of congruence. I mean, you have this ring which you want to understand. Sorry, this, you have this ring which you want to understand. There is this ring you, are to, you construct which you want to understand and you want to pass the control. You want to pass from understanding this component to this component, right? So some of the fact that this uh, thing is ramified at all primes in Q means that this tangent space of this guy, for example, is just equal to P to the cardinality of the primes in Q. That's again some easy computation in Galois cohomology once you have such ramification. So now, uh, but now the, what one can ask, there's no T in the picture, right? So now I'm hope, what one could hope for is to try and uh, look at this other thing, which is the eta invariant. What about the congruence invariant? Can one show that it is also this same number? And for that, okay, and for that we kind of have, an, have a kind of code out to this theorem, where you, where you kind of, at least you kind of, at least in terms of congruences, you one suggests to oneself that, that there are these, that, that something like this should, could happen, which is that you can do level lowering purely at the level of Galois cohomology. So that's kind of the new theorem, new, new result compared to this kind of thing maybe we could do 15 years ago. Oh. Further, there are level, further, so that's a continuation of this theorem. Further, there are level lowering congruences. Systematic order. Right, essentially, okay, let, as I've run out of time, let me not say what these congruences are. Basically, what it tells you is that uh, there's a mod p congruence between this rho q nu and, and, and something with no level q in it, right? So somehow you can drop the level at q uh, to the degree of, ram to the depth of the ramification. Here I assumed it was p, so you can drop it mod p only. So therefore, there are systematic level, level, level lowering congruences, uh, and this is done purely by Galois cohomology. So now the question is, what else do you need? Uh, so, so now therefore you have this ring R, S union q. It has this augmentation pi to zp. You know that the tangent space is uh, p to the cardinality of the set of primes q, and you can produce sort of, sort of q distinct congruences. I'm not stressed. I'm, I'm not telling you what these congruences are, but you can imagine they're like kind of very independent congruences you can produce. Now, does the, so the question is, can one show using these congruences that the eta invariant has grown? O mod eta or something is uh, bigger than equal to p to the nq. Right, for that, typically one would uh, appeal to some Gorenstein properties of these Hecke algebra, of these rings, which are of course not available, not expected, or maybe not available, certainly uh, here. And, uh, and, and the utility of being, being able to do this is that one can look at Wiles' proof, or look at proofs of Weber or some date order. You can look at uh, the proofs of the numerical isomorphic criteria and observe that if you can actually prove this equality, then it follows and if you assume further the condition that R is of depth at least zero, uh, bigger than zero, 
There's also a small, some small commute, com commutative algebra result, which maybe I'll end with. Proposition, suppose you have some com no, no Ethereum ring R with a morphism pi to ZP, such that the tangent space of phi pi is finite and is equal to the congruence module, which you can just formally define here, is equal to the cardinality of ZP modulo pi of the annihilator in R of the kernel of pi. Right? So this is like a small refinement of Wiles. So suppose, assume this, plus, and you assume, so the numerical equality, and you assume that the depth of R is positive, is not, is not zero. Then this implies that R is of dimension one. And we, we at least as far as we, we have not been able to construct counterexamples to showing that it's of dimension one, dropping this assumption. Uh, so yeah, so it's in some sense, Wiles assumed to begin with that the ring was finite over ZP, we drop that, drop that condition, and the same proof more or less works. And so somehow the equality, the, the Wiles numerical coincidence detects the dimension of a ring. Right? So it'll be, it'll be interesting to be able to show that the congruence module is deep enough, using the congruences perhaps. Or, because these geometric arguments of level lowering do not work in this situation because there's no geometry, there's no Shimura variety, in, at least in any obvious way. And so we are, we are trying to do something more naive rather than Using geometric methods of level lowering, we are doing it by hand, by Galois Komarji. Okay, thank you. <laughs>